All right. Thank you very much, and um, really pleased to be here. Last talk before dinner. Uh, I have some slides in here to make you really hungry, so we'll see that. Uh, I'm going to talk about something that may be a little different uh, from a software perspective. I'm going to talk about breaking abstractions and um, really writing software that's very optimized for the physics of devices. I'm going to try to motivate that and also tell you what the challenges are uh, in doing that. Uh, this work uh, started out as uh, something called the National Science Foundation uh, in the U.S. Um, Expedition in Computing, a uh, project that we call EPIC. Uh, and later you'll see that many of the things I'll talk about you can find there along with different videos and stuff. And then uh, actually some of it spun out to a startup company called Supertech which was then acquired by Inflection, uh, at the time called Quanta. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about both uh, some of our research and some of the things that have been implemented um, in Inflection software. Okay, so um, when we started this work um, about six years ago, uh, you know, the state of the art was starting to evolve in terms of software stacks. And um, I don't know how many of you have a classical background. Uh, I, I am a classical computer architect, actually, by training. Um, you know, the temptation is to build this software stack, which looks pretty familiar, actually. It's pretty much just a classical software stack with Q in front of all the things. <laughs> um, not to, you know, shortchange this work. This work was... Uh, published in 2017 by our colleagues at Delft, and it actually won Best Paper at the conference it was published at. So it was actually quite a good paper that uh, uh, dealt with some real-time challenges. Uh, but uh, I think our philosophy over the last five years has been to really break through this stack and break abstractions and think very much about the physics of devices. Um, and the idea there is to really try to optimize uh, for the efficiency that we can get out of these machines, both in terms of qubits, in terms of gate fidelities, uh, in terms of application uh, tolerance to um, errors. Okay, so I'm going to give you examples today of a very sort of hardware-first view of things. And the idea is that, you know, if you look at, you know, the dimensions of the quality of a machine, uh, probably the easy one is how many qubits you have, the hard one is what kind of fidelity you can get out of that machine. You know, we're sort of in this lower left-hand corner of things um, right now. And our philosophy really is to really expend a lot of classical computation and do deep optimization of our quantum circuits and get us further up in this uh, picture and try to bring applications closer to the hardware that we're going to have in the near future. And this has, uh, you know, a fair bit of precedent in classical computation. Um, this idea of deep optimization or super optimization is fairly common um, for things like production binaries, right? If you're Microsoft and you're going to ship a binary that everyone's going to use, um, you might spend, you know, days of classical computation to optimize that binary, right? Um, in this case, the motivation is, you know, it's going to take, you know, 5, 10, 15 years to build machines that are, you know, close to that frontier. And the idea is to get, you know, factors of 10 or even 100, uh, which would move us in that direction, uh, which is going to be, you know, 5, 10 years of machine development time. Now, at the same time, um, you know, we are starting to scale, and I think that's something that's uh, been talked about today, especially because this is a software forum, and, uh, you know, we talked about design automation. Um, if you take a look at uh, some statistics we took uh, a few years ago, uh, th these are different passes of IBM's Qiskit compiler. And, um, and, you know, we ran this on, you know, a realistic machine, and then we also ran it on a hypothetical, you know, about 1,000 qubit machine. And you can see that the... The compile time of these passes, of course, uh, scales quite substantially. And on the right there, you're looking at hours of uh, classical computation. So at the same time that I say that we should break abstraction and look very much at um, 
the physics of machines, we also are, in the long run, going to have to be very selective about what we do. Now, I'm going to take a somewhat uh, extreme view, which is going to plug into my talk in various ways. Um, you know, if we think about the advantage we hope to get in quantum machines, ideally, that's some sort of exponential advantage. Now, I would argue that in order to, to get there, we're going to be investing substantial classical computation, both in terms of optimization of circuits, also in terms of hybrid uh, quantum classical algorithms, which we've heard a little bit about today, uh, and also uh, actually in terms of uh, simulation of quantum circuits, which you'll see is also very useful for both uh, sort of debugging, verifying, and even optimizing quantum circuits. So my sort of hypothesis is, you know, we, in the extreme case, we may be looking at a contest of two exponentials, right? So some cost to making our computations run well, some gain, and then as long as we keep that gap, you know, sort of large enough, and we have essentially a, a uh, exponential with a much uh, lower exponent, then we can get substantial gains. Now, of course, uh, there are algorithms that are only going to give us polynomial advantage, so then we're looking at maybe some smaller polynomial there. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of launch into uh, quite a number of small examples of what you can do if you go beyond sort of the traditional abstraction of uh, you know, sort of a, a universal gate set that software may see. All right, so this is the part where I may, might make you hungry. So the idea is that, you know, we see typically from the software level some universal gate set, and then we compile to that, right? But really, there's sort of a secret menu of quantum hard for quantum hardware, and that's analogous to these different fast food restaurants, uh, which I don't know, I mean, this is pretty common in the United States. I don't know how, much, how many of you have seen these different things, but these things are not on the menu of any of these restaurants, but you can in fact order them, right? You can go into uh, Taco Bell and say, you know, I want the combination of an enchilada and a burrito and say, give me an enchilada. Okay, but similarly, you know, we typically see a menu which is like a, a C naught or uh, some sort of uh, RZ rotation, uh, maybe a, a not gate. Um, but if we look down at the machines themselves, we'll see that we can have a parameterized cross-resonance gate, we can have a parameterized Lomo Sorensen gate, we can have Qtrit, uh, sort of, we, talk, we heard a little bit about Qtrits today, I think, from a poster and maybe some of the other talks. So these are all things that we could use if we uh, sort of expend the effort to, uh, to create a backend for each one of these machines and be very specific, uh, which you'll see, uh, for example, in our uh, inflection product, we've done that. And, uh, and you can get uh, substantial gains. Okay, so I'm gonna go through, I think, uh, about nine or 10 examples here, um, very quickly, and I'll take questions. Okay, so this is some work that we did at Inflection with uh, the other AQT, now that I'm in Europe. Uh, this is uh, the Advanced Quantum Test Bed, which is at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and it's a uh, superconducting system. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, and it has this sort of uh, gate set. And what I'm going to show you here is what kind of thing can you do if you look down at the native gate set. And this is an interesting example. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to try to implement this thing, the ZZ swap. And uh, as we uh, learned in some previous talks, we're going to have to do some synthesis to get down to the um, uh, native gates of this machine to implement the ZZ swap. And it turns out there's this sort of fun thing we can do. We can synthesize the ZC swap in many, many different ways. Okay? And so there are uh, 32 decompositions that use a controlled Z, 64 that use control Z and controlled S. And there's some uh, sort of transformations we can do on top of those. So we have literally, you know, sort of hundreds of different ways that we can do this, right? So here's the fun thing we can do. What we're going to do is we're going to randomly choose between those different decompositions. Okay? What's that going to do? That's basically going to give us, uh, if you've ever heard of randomized compiling, it's basically a way that's going to randomize the noise that we see in our system. And then we can do something here, which is 
We can randomize, but we never choose a random decomposition that's going to make the circuit longer. Okay. What do we get? Uh, we basically sort of for free get this sort of like 60 to 30% error reduction through this randomization, which is just a really interesting, you know, uh, machine-specific optimization that we were able to do. Okay. This also was, uh, what you'll see is, most of the work we do sort of goes this way. An experimentalist comes to us and says, we can do this on our hardware. You know, how, do, you know, how can we take advantage of that? And uh, this, is one of, this is a very close collaboration with AQT's hardware team. Um, okay, so other things that we have done have sort of made it into this software tool called SuperStack. An embarrass victory by having this picture up here. There's victory. Uh, there's a poster that we have. If you haven't gone by it yet, you can learn more about it. I'll just give you one example from here, or two examples. Okay. Uh, so one thing that we have done in that tool set is we've made a sort of a timing-aware uh, optimization, right? So typically, uh, you know, your IR or whatever representation of your machine that you have is, does not actually give you control over time. So for example, if you compile to Qiskit, um, Qiskit controls time, and so you don't know when things are going to happen. Uh, we actually have to compile to, for example, the Qiskit OpenPulse interface so that we can control when things happen. And in this case, we're going to do uh, something called dynamic decoupling, which essentially, if you're a classical person, it's like doing a memory refresh or something, right? Basically, you do this periodically, and it actually um, uh, decouples your, uh, in this case, the ZZ coupling, which is uh, ever present in your IBM machine. Now, we, what we actually discovered with dynamic decoupling, which is a pretty well-known technique, is that if you try to do it simultaneously on a lot of different qubits, uh, you get crosstalk between them. And so you have to be really careful about how you schedule them. So we do this like graph coloring, and we keep them offset from each other, right? And so it works really well. Uh, you, know, you can see before dynamic coupling, you basically get the wrong answer. This is in bernstein vazirani After dynamic decoupling, you get a very significant fidelity gain and a very significant difference between the wrong answer and the right answer. So this is just an example of some of the many things we do, but in this case, I just want to show you that like, access to timing control is very important. Okay, uh, here's another um, capability that's in the SuperStack uh, software, and uh, this actually uses the Berkeley uh, Biscuit tool, which Kostin, standing over there, is going to talk about tomorrow, I think. <laughs> um, and what this does is basically automatically allows you to take uh, sort of any machine's native gates, specify their unitaries, they feed them into the SuperStack. SuperStack then calls Bizkit to resynthesize your unitaries into those native unitaries, and it gives us the ability to sort of automatically target your machine. Um, here's sort of a, uh, a, one of our more adventurous things we did. Uh, the Berkeley AQT machine supports Qtrit operators. And uh, we ran the Qtrit operators through our compiler, and we synthesized the Qtrit swap. Uh, it's not the highest fidelity, but, but, uh, but it works. Um, it's not easy to do Qtrit swaps. OK, but here's an even more extreme view, uh, which isn't in the product, but, but is uh, from my research group. And the idea is you know, really bring your own gate set. But um, this actually came from a collaboration with Andrew Hauck at Princeton. And this is another one of those conversations where uh, Andrew came to me and he said, you know, you software people always tell me that I should tune up like a CNOT or a cross-residence gate between all my qubits so that you can run your software. But what I'd really like to do is I'd like to tune up the best sort of primitive two-qubit gate between every pair of qubits and allow it to be different, okay? because qubits vary. And he said, so can you, just, can you write a compiler that will do that, like use that for me? I was like, oh, yeah, I think that's, that's fine. So this is what we did. This is called let your two qubits choose your gates. Okay, so the idea is 
you can look at sort of the possible two qubit gates given the control constraints of uh, these, in this case, this transmon system. And this, uh, given some symmetries, you can represent that in terms of a tetrahedron. It's called the wild chamber. And typically, the gates that we use are along this red vector or this green vector. And they're represented this way because this is the identity. And what happens is you apply a control pulse, and you get, as you wait, you'll travel along this line. And then you'll get these typical things we use, uh, C0 or CZ, CR, controlled phase. Um, these are all like I swap and B swap. These are all two qubit gates that are commonly used. Okay? So that's fine. But the problem is when you actually try to do that, the qubits vary. And the trajectory you actually get looks something like that. It, it diverges from the vector that you want to be on. Okay? Now, so then either you get a gate that isn't the gate you want and the fidelity is low, or you can actually wait. And what happens is this trajectory will wrap around and keep changing. And if you wait long enough, you'll actually get to the point where you want. But that's really slow and it's bad for coherence time. Okay, so instead, what we'd like to do is figure out a better way to do this. Like, what are equivalent gates that you might want to synthesize or accomplish in this wild chamber? And we were initially very excited to learn that, you know, we looked at swap gates because you've got a superconducting system, you have to do a lot of swaps to move your data around and get it next to each other so you can do the gates you want. Um, so it turns out you can actually do swap in two gates. So the traditional way is sort of three gates, three C knots. Right? Uh, in fact, the CNOTs can be expensive, so it's, it's all the old way is sort of bad. So here it turns out if you can hit this purple line, uh, you can implement a gate that can implement swap in two steps. Or if you can hit this orange line, then there's another gate that's different, that's complementary, and then you implement two gates that also will give you a swap. Okay, but what we discovered was, this is conceptually really interesting, but practically not good. Because when you have a trajectory that's sort of uh, error prone, it's hard to hit a line, right? And so you have to like keep going around and around until you hit that line somewhere. It's better than one point, but it's still not very good. So it turns out, you really should just do it in three steps as we normally do, but we should just allow yourself not to be restricted to a C naught. Okay? So it turns out that the, all of the gates in this white volume in here can implement a swap in three steps. Okay? Uh, and then, because it's a volume, all we have to do is start in the corner, go along any trajectory towards the middle, and as soon as we hit the plane that is the, the edge of that volume, then we have the fastest gate that gives us a, a swap in, th in three steps. So it turns out if we do this, and uh, we also do something for an entangling gate, we can get you know, significant reduction in uh, error. Uh, and we can, uh, on, on benchmarks, we get an even higher reduction because you have many gates, right? Um, now, the cool thing here is we broke the abstraction of uniform basis gates, right? We have any kind of gate. Now, the hard thing, which uh, you still have to work on, is you know you have to calibrate a different gate now for every pair, which is going to be potentially very hard. Uh, although, since the gates may not change too much over time, you do the hard problem once, and then you can recalibrate those things later. OK, so this is just a sort of maybe an extreme view of bring your own gate set. In this case, a set of many, many different gates. All right, so let's go maybe even a little further. Um, so we heard a little bit about uh, Qtrits before, uh, and we actually many years ago did some work in Qtrits. Uh, and lately, we've been going even further and looking at Qquartz and arbitrary Qdit computation. And um, I just tell this story a little bit because it motivates our work in uh, pulse optimization in terms of designing gates. And so, you know, I think about four or five years ago, four years ago, we did some work on Qtrits and looked at uh, just using Qtrit states to take the place of Ancilla 
in different uh, quantum circuits. And we found that we could have significant reductions uh, in the number of ancilla you need by just borrowing the third state from your data qubits. Um, now, the problem we had with those constructions was we mostly had to design the uh, Qtrit circuits by hand. Um, although I think there is some resynthesis work being done towards Qtrits lately. But in general, Qtrits are just a lot harder to resynthesize qubit circuits to. Uh, Q chords would be really easy because a Q-chord is just two qubits, and it's really easy to take two qubits and put them in there, right? Now, three or three, four years ago, we thought, hey, let's write some papers about Q-chords. And then we ran our compiler and our cost model, and it never worked. Because basically, the theory would predict that the error would uh, grow polynomially, um, it would grow uh, quadratically with the dimension, right? So if you go to q trids and Q-chords, things get worse and worse, and uh, it never, there was never a win, right? And then, in the meantime, we had done a lot of work on sort of optimizing, using optimal control to optimize pulses for designing gates. And we thought, oh, maybe we should do that for Q quartz, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what we did. Uh, in this case, we used some tools uh, from Lawrence Livermore, uh, which basically, they're, they're optimal control tools that uh, uh, use the sort of differentiability of the of the the, uh, the landscape to find an optimal pulse, and um, this this is the kind of thing we do. So you have a population of four different states, and then we have a gate that moves you to a different population, and the gate looks uh, something like this. Um, as an aside, you might notice that. Um, the optimizer often seems to do something a little bit random, and then in the last, like, 20% of the cycle, suddenly it's correct. <laughs> so um, it, there's a lot of work to be done in making the, this be a little bit better behaved. Um, but even with these optimizers, uh, we were able to get pretty good results. And one thing that we did was, uh, there's a lot of art in, like, getting a short pulse implementation of a complex gate. Um, and the way we ended up doing it is we found a solution that was feasible in some longer amount of time, and then we truncate that solution, say, by 10%, and then we seed the next search with this shorter thing, and then it sort of fixes it up, basically. If you're not too far from the solution, then this optimizer might find the solution. Right? So we do that, and after we do that, here are a whole bunch of different Q, uh, QDIT operators going from uh, radix 2 qubits to q trids, q quartz, and all the way up to q ox. And what you find here is, well, it is basically still quadratic, but it's very flat. And given that flat nature, you know, if you only want to go up to about four, it's not very bad, right? And that actually allowed us to uh, do a couple of interesting things. So we uh, did a study where we just sort of tried to compress things and make the circuit you know, basically half as big, use half as many devices, roughly. Uh, and so it's about the same fidelity, because you lose some, but the compression makes the communication is less, right? So everything's smaller. Uh, so there, you know, we've got this compression, but we, and we got a gain of basically using uh, half as many devices as you would need. And then we had this actually pretty interesting paper where if you look at a, a three-qubit gate, say a Toffoli, right? Here you have two controls and a target. So two controls and a target here. If you take the two controls and you put them in a Q-quart, and you put the target in a Q-bit, it's very fast. Uh, it's basically because you're essentially computing the logical AND here within a single device, and it's much easier to do. Uh, and so when we did the sort of pulse solution of this, it's about uh, five times faster than the pulse solution of this one, actually. Uh, so that's a sort of a, was an also interesting thing. Okay, uh, let me see, how am I doing on time? Uh, ten, pretty good. All right, so those are examples of like very low level physical things that we did, which I think, you know, is breaking this interesting abstraction, right? Um, 
what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit of, like, at the algorithmic level, other things we can do which have to do with investing classical computation, right? Um, the first one here actually it just motivates this idea that many times we need to do a noise mitigation optimization in our compiler that's data dependent and it's, uh, it's program dependent. And uh, so we can't statically figure out, for example, where the best place to put dynamic decoupling is or where the best place to do other kinds of error mitigation. Um, and what we need actually, what you'll see, is what we really like to have is the ground truth. Basically, we'd like to know what the ideal answer is, but we usually don't know the ideal answer because why would we be running the program if we already knew the answer, right? So in this particular case, we got around that because for variational algorithms, you already have an objective that you're minimizing, for example, the ground state of the system. So what we did was we just added uh, parameters, which were basically the noise mitigation parameters, and then we simultaneously optimize for the objective of lower, lowest energy and lowest noise. It was basically, we're just trying to get both of them to be low, right? And uh, it was interesting, it worked pretty well because uh, there are two problems with that. Number one, uh, you have more parameters so you might get lost and you might not be able to find the solution, but uh, it worked pretty well still. And then the other is we, had to, we actually had to prove that we didn't do anything that put us below the valid solution space, right? So there's actually a proof in here that, that uh, assuming, you know, the, the kind of noise mitigation that we did, we couldn't go below the valid space because you might be worried that you sort of force your circuit into some sort of non-unitary noise mitigation that pushes you below the valid space. Okay, so this was our first step at trying to do this kind of um, mitigation. But then the next thing we did was uh, we started to use some other techniques. Now this is a technique also for multiple iterations of an application. And in this particular case, instead of trying to do something with the ground truth, um, we actually just took two iterations of, of the computation, the current one and the older one. And we took an older one and we compared it against the previous iteration that we did. And this was just a simple thing to detect when this happens. Okay, so uh, we found that on IBM machines, occasionally you would get some sort of relatively catastrophic event and you would get a, a transient error that was quite severe. And what, that ha what happens in tran these transient errors is when you're trying to converge across iterations, this thing really throws you off. Right, and then you have to do a lot more work to get back down again. Right? And so what this technique does is it uses this sort of difference of two iterations to um, detect this and then basically just skip that iteration. And if you just skip that one and then go on again, then you get this like red line, which is much nicer. Okay, so those are two simple techniques, um, but now I'm gonna uh, go in a different direction, which is more in the direction of quantum simulation. Now what we're going to do is we're actually going to use, um, I think there was already some mention of, I think uh, Matthias mentioned Clifford circuits, but in the fault tolerant regime. What we're going to look at here is we're going to approximate um, programs with Clifford only um, circuits. Okay, so this, this is interesting. Um, this work, uh, which my postdoc Gokul Ravi did, um, and he, he's actually now going to be faculty at Michigan. Um, he came to me and said, you know, I think we can use multiple runs on different machines to make, to boost the fidelity of the distribution that we get. And I said, that will never work. <laughs> I said that to him three times and he put me wrong every time. Um, you know, basically, I was like, there's, there's only so much signal. You can't get more signal, right? Well, actually, you can. And the way he gets more signal is, he uses the fact that different, like, you have 12 different machines, they have different uh, variation, different characteristics, and you run your, your circuit on each one, it turns out that different machines will be better at specific outputs, depending upon how it's mapped on there, how it runs, what, how the qubits are. And so what you can do is, if you knew, like, for all your different outputs, which machine was best at each output, 
then you could reconstruct the distribution and get a higher fidelity distribution, right? The trick is, how do you know that? And it turns out the way he knows that is he approximates the circuit with this thing, which we call the Clifford canary, which is basically just map it to the closest Clifford circuit. Then we can simulate the Clifford circuit with no noise on a classical supercomputer, and we can find out, you know, what's the ideal answer. Then once we know the ideal distribution, we can run it on a whole bunch of machines. Then we know which machine is best at which output. Then we run the real circuit and on the same machines, and then we assume that on the real circuit, the same behavior happens. It turns out it is rather consistent. And then we get a much better boosted fidelity at the end. Uh, this was sort of surprising to me. It works great. Uh, and it sort of starts to show the power of simulating approximate circuits in our optimizations. Um, we also had some other recent work, which isn't published yet, which is about, uh, uses sort of Clifford circuits to guide like what compiler options, what passes to use. Um, here's something different, though. Um, here is a Clifford circuit, which is used to approximate the ansatz for a, a VQE computation. Right? So here we take uh, the circuit that we're going to use to uh, parameterize uh, your, you know, our quantum chemistry calculation. And what we first do is we approximate it, uh, basically restrict it to Clifford-only parameters. And then we do a classical search amongst all those parameters. And we use that classical search to find the best restricted parameterization of this algorithm to use as an initial point. Okay. So here you can see that this is uh, the sort of traditional way to do this initialization. In the blue line, that's hartree fock uh, initialization, and this is the, this, the, the Kafka technique, this Clifford technique, right? So it's significantly better, and then it allows us to converge a lot faster. And then similarly, if you look at um, hartree fock initialization as we vary the bundling, right, we're gonna get a much nicer uh, curve here that, uh, that's much lower as an initialization. So right now, actually, what we're waiting to do is try to find a machine that's good enough to improve this guess. The guess is so good that it's hard to improve it, actually. Um, and in fact, we spent six months trying to verify this, this result because, once again, Gokul came to me with this and I said, that can't be right. Go make sure it's right. <laughs> and so six months later, we're like, oh, I guess it's right. <laughs> um, so just uh, uh, just summarizing that part, you know, I think this, like in that contest of two exponentials, in this case, it's not actually an exponential, it's, it's, it's a, you know, polynomially scaling simulation. Um, there's some really interesting work we can do. Um, actually, the, if, if we had the, um, the ideal curve here, there's a gap between the ideal curve and this green curve. And, uh, and we can potentially fill that in if we add some non-Clifford gates to the ansatz, and then we have to simulate non-Clifford gates, uh, and then that costs us exponentially, right? And so there's some work to be done here where we can even improve this if we're willing to spend more classical computation. All right, so one last thing. Um, you know, in all this software work that we do, and all the sort of optimization and co-design with, with uh, hardware, uh, I think historically we know that, that benchmarks, uh, sort of driving applications, are really important. Uh, this is some work that we did on uh, sort of designing a first set of benchmarks. And I think the interesting part of this study was actually to try to come up with a, uh, a methodology which is driven by our experience in sort of classical computation and classical architectures. And in this particular case, we try to come up with different uh, sort of a feature vector here, which uh, sort of establishes the characteristics of, the, of each benchmark or application. And then here we try to correlate those features with performance on different machines. Um, this was done a couple of years ago. Um, we need to, I think we're about to do the next set of benchmarks. I think it needs to evolve to be, uh, to include more variational benchmarks, to include uh, more error correction benchmarks, and also to now there's a higher diversity of machines, so we can do more interesting correlation studies. And by the way, this is an example of work that was collaborative between 
uh, UChicago and our company, and I found it extremely beneficial as, a, as an academic to have sort of industrial strength software that could cross compile across many, many targets. And so, you know, for those of you, um, you know, who, who are out there doing research, I think uh, assuming, well, I guess, in my case, uh, my university had to allow it, but actually if it's not your company, then it's not really a problem. Um, it, you know, I think that collaborative sort of indus industry uh, sort of academic research is really powerful. Okay, uh, let me start to wrap up. Um, you know, I didn't have a chance to talk uh, about you know, all the different interesting issues, I think, in the, in the software world, but here are some things that I think are, are, are going to be interesting as we go forward, right? As I mentioned, you know, how to scale these things that we've learned, uh, in the, that we've learned in the small scale, basically, uh, to get more efficiency into the future. Um, I think there needs to be a lot more attention paid to you know, the design of hybrid classical quantum algorithms. I think to some degree we're too used to taking existing classical optimizers and then just putting, pairing them with a quantum kernel. There's a lot more co-design to be done there, I think. Um, I didn't talk about it, but you know, I think other people have talked about a little bit uh, debugging and verification of, of software and programs. Um, I think even as we move forward to the fault tolerant era, I think error mitigation is going to be very important. And in terms of uh, the optimizations that we do that use a sort of a static model of the machine and the Hamiltonian of the machine, uh, the more consistent we can make the machines, the better off we're going to be. And right now they're a little bit too variable and makes it very hard to optimize for them. And then I very much favor a sort of out of the box hardware software co-design, looking at sort of novel features of machines and technologies and devices and looking at you know, how we can maybe go a little bit outside of what we're used to doing, uh, both in terms of QDIDs. Uh, we recently did this design of sort of using heterogeneous devices, uh, multi-qubit operators, uh, and also, you know, as has been discussed here, analog computation and simulation. Um, and then I'll just maybe end with this slide, which shows um, you know, it's a lot of work, but you can build a software stack that can target many different platforms. Um, there's some commonality in, in, in the kinds of things that you do, but it also requires, you know, fairly uh, high expertise in your compiler team uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a fairly physical level. But, um, you know, I think that sort of in aggregate, you can really get a lot out of... Uh, you know, all these different uh, optimizations for all these multiple platforms. All right, so let me just stop here. You can find out a lot more about all these things, both at our academic site and um, our company site. Um, uh, I'll just say, I, I didn't talk too much about education, but, you know, I think we have, we have a YouTube channel here that has uh, a few hundred videos, um, has something like 180,000 views. Um, and it has so both very basic tutorials and, uh, and some of more advanced things like these uh, very physical optimizations that we talk about. And um, I'll just say that um, a shout out to the talk before. I've often seen uh, links to Penny Lane tutorials <laughs> when people are like, hey, think about this. Oh, and here's a link to how you can learn about it. <laughs> Great, right, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Thank you.